Coming up, launches, engines, senators, Konnichiwa. space, now! And welcome to Tomorrow for Saturday, December 12th, 2015. This is episode 8.36. Now, before we get started with Space News, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who helped to make this specific segment happen. These are the people who have contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. You'll notice there are a few new names on there. So thank you, new patrons of Tomorrow, for helping to support the show. You can find out more information on how you can support the shows of Tomorrow over at patreon.com. Slash T M R O. We've got a uh, full studio here. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. I'm joined by Jared Head. We've got Mike Clark slash Space Mike, and we've also got my beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented wife, Carrie Ann Higginbotham. All right, let's go ahead and get started with some <laughs> space launch coverage. First up is this Soyuz 2 launch. <laughs> That launch clearly brought to you by GoPro. <laughs> uh, don't wait. There's another, there, there's another epic shot sitting right over here. This is Saturday, December 6th at 1409 Coordinated Universal Time. It's the Canopus ST Earth Observing Satellite that was launched. Uh, it's a microwave and ultraviolet sensors. They're designed to study the world's oceans, although some say it's to bolster the military's, uh, Russian military's anti-submarine capabilities. Uh, it actually also had a second pay payload. I think it's KYUA1. I don't think you pronounce it. Kua? Kuya? I Kaiua. Just, Kaiua? I don't know. I don't know. Nah. Uh, nah. That's a, a reflective spherical satellite that they're design, uh, is designed for radar tests. They're going to bounce stuff off of that. And uh, uh, this was the uh, first flight of an NK-33 type engine since the Antares failure uh, early, uh, late last year. And uh, the M Russian military defense said that that launch was successful. Yeah. Well, it's the launch sort of. was successful. The launch. The launch was, in fact, successful. Uh, <laughs> and then, like, a day later, they're like, well, hmm, may have been a slight hitch. Uh, while the KYUA pay payload did make it out successfully, the main payload, the Canopus ST, failed to deploy. Um, it fell back to the atmosphere on Tuesday, December 8th at 0543 coordinated universal time. And what happened was one of the locks that connects the spacecraft to the rocket didn't unlock. Whoops. Which means it was connected to the rocket for the rest of its life. So Whoops. that sucks. Yeah, yeah that's that sucks. Typically but not. the rocket, the engines, the NK-30, which, by the way, fun factoid, those are the same engines that were used on the N-1 rocket that was Russia's moon program. So basically, they had these massively huge engines. These, these things a lot are, of them. A, a lot <laughs> of them. And then they mothballed <laughs> this program, and they kind of stuck them in storage. And then, like, 40 years later, people were like, why don't we use those? And um, they mostly work. Mostly. <laughs> when you don't modify them. <laughs> well, they, you know, they didn't really work on the N1 either. Yeah, that's true, too. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, modified, unmodified, I'm not sure it matters. <laughs> so, there you go. All right, next up, an Atlas V launch. This was carrying the Cygnus spacecraft uh, to the International Space Station. Three, two, one. Lift off on the shoulders of Atlas, the SS Deke Slayton II orbital ATK Cygnus spacecraft soars toward the International Space Station. Now, with a liftoff weight of 16,517 pounds, that's the heaviest payload an Atlas has ever launched to space. That came after three straight days of scrubs due to weather. We were even, like, the last show we had, we were waiting in after dark to see if they were going to go, but they actually, they scrubbed in the middle of the show. They're like, we're not even going to try uh, today. <laughs> uh, this brought up, uh, like, a total mass uh, packing of 7,745 pounds. That breaks down to 2,000. 604 pounds for crew supplies, 2,220 pounds for vehicle hardware, 1,867 pounds for science utilization stuff, 500 pounds for EVA gear, which is extravehicular activities, that's when they do spacewalks, and 192 pounds of computer resources. That is a lot 
of USB drives. Yes, quite a bit. <laughs> a lot of SD cards. A lot of SD cards that they brought up to weigh 500, oh, I'm sorry, 192 pounds. <laughs> uh, station captured Cygnus on December 9th at 11.19 coordinated universal time. It's going to remain at the International Space Station through late January. It's going to be loaded with about 3,000 pounds of trash or so, and it's going to break up back in the atmosphere as it uh, re-enters. So it's a giant garbage can once they once they unload it right it's, it's a delivery truck it's a mm -hmm. fedex truck and then it comes back as a garbage truck and then it just breaks up and off you go all right china launched a long march 3b with china sat 1c satellite this launched wednesday december 9th at 1646 coordinated universal time like I said, it's a long, did I say 3C? It's a 3B with, it has four solid rocket boosters on the side launching ChinaSat 1A, which is a military communications satellite. Uh, we believe it's a follow up to a similar craft named China ChinaSat 1A, easy for me to say, that was lofted up to space in September of 2011. It's likely beaming secure messaging back down to Earth for Chinese military payloads. This was the 17th launch of China this year. Holy cats! Well, way to go, guys, and the 73rd space launch worldwide to reach orbit in 2015 as of this launch, which means I've got two more launches, so you can imagine 76, did I say 75? It was 73rd, so 74 and 75, 75 for this year. Yeah. Messed that up in my brain. Assuming China doesn't launch anything else. That is not a safe city. assumption. Yeah. Not that a safe is in fact, In fact, when we hit the brakes, <laughs> uh, this week's, uh, we have two launch calendars this week because of how many launches are happening over the course of the next week. Yeah. yeah. We had to break it into two <laughs> so we could fit everything into the show. So, and I'm pretty sure one of those is a Chinese satellite launch. Probably. All right. <laughs> um, we also have a Zenit launch with an Electro L2 weather satellite. Yeah. <laughs> and the mics are out. The microphones are done. It was just too loud. I love how the camera's just shaking under the power. of. They're like, I can't. I can't sit still. These that happened sticks. Friday, December 11th at 1345, coordinating universal time. Like I said, that was the Electro L2 Weather Observatory. It has weather sensors that are going to track storms with an image refresh of approximately 30 minutes, although they can up that if they need to. for So if some weather event that they want to track faster, they can increase the speed of those... Uh, uh, refreshes. Also carries instruments to monitor space weather and a search and rescue communications payload. So probably if you're like out on a mountain and you hit a little, oh, help, I've fallen and I can't get up. Oh, <laughs> my leg broke. <laughs> Please come help me. That would be a search and rescue, rescue kind of thing. And or uh, uh, one of the emergency responder satellite yeah. frequencies. Good stuff. Yep. Um, <laughs> this was five years after the uh, last satellite went into orbit. So nearly five years Previous, did they have the last weather satellite, uh, the same satellite, Electro L, but it was an L1. And um, <laughs> this, this rocket's in a bit of an interesting state right now. Uh, it's basically um, built by U the Ukrainian government. The Ukrainians build and design this rocket. Mm -hmm. It's flown by Russia at this point because Russia, it's this weird political thing where it was basically used by Sea Launch. And then Sea Launch kind of did a whole bunch of stuff that didn't really work. And then <laughs> Roscosmos bought like 95% of Sea Launch, which means that they also got this rocket to launch. And now there's that whole Russia-Ukraine thing going on. So while there is one more of these rockets that's been built in storage, basically ready to launch, uh, what payload is it? Uh, the Spectre RG payload in 2017. There's a chance it won't fly. Now, the reason it may not fly is because the rocket's warranty has worn out. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That was the legitimate reason given. The God. rocket's warranty is... Ro Although, how long is a rocket? Is it like five years or five years. 100 million miles? Yeah, What's I was going <laughs> to say like five years, 4,000 orbits. I don't know how that works. Uh, so, I'm, yeah, go ahead, Mike. I'm assuming that there's certain parts or something like that that has to... that probably have some sort of warranty expiration on it that would have to be replaced. And maybe some of those par parts like would require like a complete disassembly or something like that. Like they might still be able to use it someday, but then again, like there's not really a whole lot of detail as to why exactly its warranty has expired, so... Politics. 
So yeah. uh, there you go. Uh, that was the uh, 83rd launch of a Zenit rocket since 1985 and his first mission <laughs> since May of 2014. And our last something, launch. Uh, no, that was oh, our last me. launch. Go ahead. Real quick, something interesting about the uh, uh, Zenit or Zenit, I'm not sure exactly how it's pronounced, is it actually started off as the liquid booster stage of Russia's Energia rocket, which is what launched their Buran space plane. Mm -hmm. And uh, instead of using solid rocket boosters, they used these liquid rocket boosters. So those boosters, it was really, uh, really kind of ingenious for Ukraine after the split up of the Soviet Union to convert that into a single launch vehicle and to have this market that they've been been, been doing since 1985. So. I also, I think that's really interesting. I think that brings up the Buran space plane for three shows in a row. Yes. Completely inadvertently. <laughs> Keeping the streak alive. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jared, uh, let's talk more about rocket engines. Yeah, I was going to say, speaking of rocket engines, Aerojet Rocketdyne has won a propulsion contract to restart on a simplified version of the RS-25D, which we actually have some footage here of an RS-25D getting put through its paces. We're not going to watch this whole thing. This is like a 10-minute clip. Oh, I will watch it because, you know, being an engineer, all right. it's all Ready? beautiful. To Ready? Be. Let's Ready? Here we, Ready? Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> now this is you a, didn't even last five seconds well i gotta talk about this because this is a simplified version of the space shuttle main engine and this contract is worth 1.16 billion dollars they're gonna be ordering seven of these engines four for one space launch system flight two for spares and one for ground certification testing and nasa currently has 16 rs 25 d's left over from the space shuttle for use on at least four space launch system flights and these will be used as the main engines for the core of the space launch system which will consist of you guessed it four rs 25s now the price is expected to be about 30 percent lower than for the space shuttle engines through the use of 3d printing and these flight certified rs 25s will actually fly at 111 percent of their rated thrust so we've kicked it up a little bit and it's going to be putting out about 512 thousand pounds of thrust I would have expected the price to have gone down further since these are not reusable, like well, or at least refurbishable, like the Space Shuttle main engine was. That is very interesting. I, it probably has to do with the fact that it's liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, and that mm. there's just no way to get around the complexity of using two cryogenic fuels instead of liquid one. Liquid hydrogen likes to not be contained. Yes, it's, <laughs> it always is like, I want to escape. So, yeah, it's very difficult to work with that. But it's it's really nice to see these these wonderful engines being used again and being put through a purpose even though i'm sad the space shuttle engines um, will not be reused because that first stage of the space launch system it, once it's done it's done it's just going to fall into the ocean but maybe jeff bezos can go pick one of those up as well what's just about to say we would like to have one uh, on display somewhere i bet also in this uh, a second propulsion contract is also picked up by aerojet rocketdyne with boeing for the Starliner's propulsion, tankage, and abort systems worth about $200 million. And they'll actually provide seven complete propulsion kits for Boeing Starliner service module. Good stuff. Cool. All right. Let's move it along. Um, I always read this title uh, as Angry Birds for some reason because it starts with the word angry in my show notes. So I'm like, <laughs> Angry Bird demands answers. I don't understand. Well, uh, Angry Birds do demand answers. They, so they do. <laughs> Those, <laughs> ironically, they're angry at the... All right. Actually, this is... All right. I'll just stop there. Um, Space Mike, take it away. Tell us about the well, Angry some, Birds. Well, someone has to be a party pooper, so let's talk. <laughs> Senator John McCain is the angry bird, and he is really upset at United Launch Alliance's uh, pretty much, a, not refusal, but, but since they refused to bid on the GPS-3 com competition that the Air Force has to launch a, one of those satellites into orbit for the whole GPS-3 constellation. John McCain is bringing up a lot of issues as to why they decided not to compete in that. And the main reason that they cited is that they cannot differentiate between the launch costs for that particular mission and all of the different go government subsidies that the Department of Defense pays United Launch Alliance for its infrastructure and something that they claim is the depreciation of their launch vehicles, as well as all of the costs that, that are included in maintaining all of the different launch facilities on the East Coast and and on the West Coast. And with that, they are also reimbursed for the actual uh, launch itself 
of every single DOD mission. On the same token, though, United Launch Alliance is required to reimburse the Department of Defense for any missions that use the Atlas V for non-DOD customers. So that is a way that United Launch Alliance kind of pays back some of those subsidies. However, with all of that, United Launch Alliance gets about a billion dollars a year in these subsidies. And because of all this confusion over all these different uh, costs that are associated with different missions, because in the, in, the, in the requirements for this GPS-3 co competition, they had to not be able to have any additional funds from other programs that would be able to uh, pretty much give them a leg up or, or additional benefits on, on this particular launch mission. And so United Launch Lines is claiming that they don't have the accounting systems to be able to tell the difference between what would help and what wouldn't for this mission. Also, they're claiming that they don't have enough RD-180 engines that power the Atlas V engine to, be, uh, to do this mission. And with that, before the whole National Defense uh, Security Act of 2015, where they put a ban on use of RD-180 engines for national security payloads, at that time, United Launch Alliance had five RD-180 engines that were already paid for. And instead of setting those aside for national security payloads, what happened was they rushed to assign those to non-Department of Defense payloads. And in a way creating a shortage, an artificial shortage, and thus needing a waiver or some sort of, sort of a, a lift of the ban on these RD-180 engines. So John McCain is very angry about all of this, and he's calling for an audit of United Launch Alliance's business accounting systems. And he's also making sure that other senators don't give in to the pressure and take away, or give waivers rather, to use more RD-180 engines for national security payloads. As far as non-Department of Defense payloads, United Launch Alliance can continue to use RD-180 RD engines for as long as they want, but not for national security payloads for the U.S. government. So we're, we're just going to have to see whether or not they uh, fully do this uh, audit and, and present it to John McCain's uh, uh, people and see whether or not they will be able to be banned from future competition missions if they can't have the accounting that they need and also to not get more RD-180 engines. So that's what's going on with John McCain and hopefully Congress doesn't give him to pressure and stays kind of firm with their convictions or puts some sort of lift or does something. They're kind of forced to act at this point to do something to make sure that the Department of Defense has space access. So that's what's going on with that. And uh, <laughs> with that, I don't have a good segue, but I'm passing it back over to you guys. <laughs> well, uh, let me, didn't Senator Shelby, I think it was Senator Shelby, say that he wanted to uh, work on lifting or changing the verbiage to lift the ban on the RD-180? So you got one, one person who's trying to hold it and one person who's trying to lift it. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah, Senator Shelby definitely is wanting to to have the RD one eighty that ban lifted, and his constituents are the ones that would benefit from most from that. So that explains his motivation behind that. So we're just going to have to see what uh, what develops with this. But as of right now, the United Launch Alliance is still restricted from uh, purchasing any new RD one eighty RD one eighty engines for national security payloads. Speaking of national security payloads, let's talk about uh, Japan looking to further the relationship with the U.S. That's my segue. <laughs> with, the, uh, with the U.S. What you got? Wow. Um, so <laughs> Japan is really I'm excited sorry, to. Carry on. No, it's okay. It's I, there really isn't a good segue there. It's fine. Um, Japan is looking to further the relationship with the United States of America uh, in space, and not just with the International Space Station, but also with. Uh, GPS satellites, particularly um, right now, what they what they're doing is what Japan and the U.S. are doing in space. Japan is looking at as uh, a dependency, and they're looking for more of an equal relationship, uh, which sounds really much like a boyfriend girlfriend thing. But I, so I apologize. <laughs> that's that's not what's going on. Um, but Japan feels like they can help out with space based navigation. They can manufacture and launch the GPS satellites on behalf of the United States government uh, for the uh, global positioning system that America's already got going. And then they would like uh, greater cooperation in more other areas like remote sensing or Earth learning satellites and space threats with like early warning satellites of asteroids and other things that might come in from space that we're not expecting. Um, so that's something that they're working towards. Uh, paperwork isn't finalized quite yet, um, but in that paperwork, it is predicted that uh, the 
the contract that Japan has for the International Space Station would be pushed all the way through 2024, which is what China, or no, I'm sorry, not China, what Canada and Russia have already have with, along with the U.S. for International Space Station. So it's a greater partnership um, of furthering, like I said, of their relationship, as it were, an equal partnership, I suppose. It also sounds like the, really the sta space station moving to 2024 sounding more and more um, like a sure thing. Yes. Based on that. Oh, yeah, because everyone else has already Europe. said yes to 2024. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, you need all of your, well, you don't need all of your partners. You need the two big partners to do it first, yeah. and, and that pretty much happened. But yes. now it sounds like everyone else is kind of glomming onto it as well, going, yeah, we're going to, we'll go ahead and support that to 2024. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's great to have that extra, extra amount of time in order to continue to do research. More time that. for more science. That's right. All right. Something uh, else that might be kind of a weird benefit if this deal goes through is with the GPS for some, uh, specifically, this isn't in the show notes but the Air Force is actually having a problem right now that their systems on the ground aren't going to be capable enough to uh, accept all of the data that they're going to get from GPS-3 mm -hmm. satellites, yeah. which means that the capability, even though the satellites would be up there, wouldn't actually materialize for five to ten years. And this is just me speculating that maybe a partnership with Japan would accelerate that process for all the ground systems. And, you know, if we have that partnership, then GPS-3 would be online much faster, possibly. Just, yeah. some, just an idea. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of out-of-the-box thinking uh, based off of what Japan and the U.S. have already done together in space and what Japan could further provide, again, to that relationship for the U.S. in space. Uh, it's Yeah, it's really interesting, very exciting. I want to head back to what is it on the ground system that can't support something in this? That, that seems completely backwards to me. Right? How, that how seems like we, something. You know all those SD cards that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, they, <laughs> we we actually needed those on the ground. So, no, but really, what is it that GPS three has that the ground systems can't keep up with? That that seems, that seems backwards. It seems like the satellite technology should always be slightly behind the ground technology because yeah. of how hard it is to do stuff in space. I'll send you the link for that because honestly, the kind of the, the computer techno babble was a little bit beyond. It went over my head, so um, I, you probably would be able to understand that a lot better. But something about them needing a lot more uh, capability and storage data, I guess, like to be able of, to I process guess, like, all of that. In terms of bandwidth on a specific frequency or something like that that they may be running on, because I know GPS three is supposed to have significantly more accurate clocks mm. on board, and obviously that's going to require more data and more a lot communication, a lot more decimals so, deep. Yes, they probably exactly. need about yeah. one point twenty one gigarams <laughs> of course <laughs> right in there somewhere in that right hmm. maybe we should follow up on this next show <laughs> <laughs> all right jared talk to us about the soyuz tma 17m which just rolls right off the tongue yeah it just does soyuz tma 17m what a great uh what a great name for your spacecraft um it returned with the expedition 45 astronauts uh just a few days ago let's take a look at the capsule Sitting there that's, out on the Kazakh actually, steps. That always looks a little bit scary to me. Doesn't it? That held three people. Yes, and it held Oleg Korninenko, oh, which is his third, his third flight uh, to space. Yeah, Korninenko. I, I'm just saying, all right, yeah, go ahead, keep going. Yeah, also, Kimia Yui, which, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm yeah, really uh, on a roll here <laughs> with all of these great uh, pronunciations of names. And also, Jell Lindgren who uh, both of those were on their first flight to space and undocked on December 11th at 9.47 coordinated universal time and landed just a little bit about three and a half hours later at 1.15 coordinated universal time in the afternoon there. Um, normally there's a medical tent set up to assess the astronauts on site and there's what the landing site looked like, a fantastic shot. Um, it landed early in the morning, uh, but there were very poor weather conditions, very cold, very a uh, little bit of snow on the ground as you can see there. And that actually ended up requiring a flight on a Russian military helicopter to a local military base so that the astronauts could get their standard medical checkout just to make sure everything's okay after uh, spending three and a half hours inside of that little itty bitty capsule and it's returning itty to itty bitty. Earth. Yeah, it's very tiny. Yeah. Um, it's like the size of a VW bug and you've got three people in their gear in that. And that's, that is just really tiny. That doesn't, I, I can't fit in a Soyuz capsule. Hmm. I'm too tall. I literally cannot fit you, inside you, uh, of You exceed so. the design specifications? I do exceed the design specifications. Yep. So uh, the <laughs> next crew is going to be launching on Soyuz TMA-19M, and they'll be doing so on December 15th at 11.03 Coordinated Universal Time. So if you've got some time, you know, check it out. And this crew will include six space flight veteran... Okay, let's try, the, let's try to get this one right. 
<laughs> Yuri Malinchenko. Malinchenko. Yeah, yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. From Roscosmos. Shuttle astronaut Timothy Copra, who, if I remember correctly, he was actually supposed to be on one of the final missions of the space shuttles, but he got into a bicycle accident and broke his hip. So he had to be replaced uh, during one of those. He's from NASA. And the first British astronaut, Timothy Peake, will be flying for the European Space Agency. Who many Stoge is a very big fan of. Yes, <laughs> that is right. Speaking, mm -hmm. speaking of Mini Stoge, Mini Stoge says she'd be totally roomy in a Soyuz. Yeah. At well, which point, um, someone said, uh, uh, Tarantula said, uh, they sized them all just for you. So, uh, <laughs> Soyuz is one unit of Mini Stoge sized. Yeah. Jared can't even fit in our car. Yeah. Jared I, cannot, absolutely legit. He cannot even fit in our car. I don't fit, in, I like don't fit in the in Tesla. The he sits in the back like this yeah. with his head. I think Stoge put uh, a photo on Twitter of me sitting in the back, literally like this. And her standing. In the Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think somebody was talking about the size limits. I think 6'1 is the tallest you can be to fit in a Soyuz, and I'm 6'3. So what are you going to do? Wow. So. Well, uh, wasn't there that movie where they chopped their legs and like, oh, no, they stretched their legs. Yeah. Oh, I don't remember that movie. Gattaca. Gattaca, thank you. Two yep. points. Gattaca. Right. Gattaca. Yep. Whatever that is. <laughs> space Mike, talk to us about SpaceX. Well, uh, speaking of things returning, uh, SpaceX is preparing, uh, preparing for their return to flight. And this is a really critical mission that uh, for this commercial launch of 11 Orbcom satellites, because not only is it their return to flight since their accident six months ago, but it's also introducing the newest version of the Falcon 9 rocket. And with this, there hasn't been any confirmation yet as to whether or not they're going to attempt a, a, a landing of the first stage of the Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, SpaceX did apply with the Air Force and the FAA to see if they would be able to get the permit to land at a particular site that's already been uh, plotted out at Cape Canaveral to attempt a land landing instead of on one of their drone ships. And like I said, there's no word yet as to whether they're going to attempt it or whether they've been given any permits from the FAA FAA or the Air Force, but uh, from the first picture that we saw of the first stage arriving, it didn't look like it had any landing legs attached to it. But the second stage has arrived at Cape Canaveral. It's being integrated together with the first stage, and uh, the payload is also being integrated uh, and will soon be encapsulated in its payload shroud if it hasn't already. And they're going to be attempting a static fire test of the first stage of the Falcon 9 on December 16th. And if everything goes well with that, they may attempt to launch three days later on December 19th. So good luck to SpaceX and uh, may the force be with you that uh, this happens, right? <laughs> and I did best because this is my true heritage. I'm showing my true colors here. <laughs> I, I just cringed Sorry. a little. A little part so. of me died, Mike. Yeah. A little part of me died. Thanks for that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Carrie Ann, we were talking about the space station, how it's going to extend to 2024. Um, what are some of the things we're going to be putting up on the space station that can help us with future habitats like Mars and whatnot? Wow. How's that? That was pretty decent, actually. That was a nice transition. Yeah, if I could get the, that transition for the other story. All right, hang on. What's the other story? <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> There's Dada no good, good transition for that. Dada I know. Dada had a good one. Uh, Dada yeah. had a good what one. It was yeah. something like... Speaking of international politics. Yeah. Speaking, speaking of, of international, international politics. All right, so, all right. So, Space Station. Uh, all right, so NASA's working with a nonprofit research and development laboratory, which I didn't even realize that that was a thing that even existed, but this place is called Draper, uh, which also just makes me think of uh, uh, Mad Men. Anyway, so there's a nonprofit <laughs> research and development laboratory called Draper that is working with NASA to bring uh, motion detection, motion tracking devices up to the International Space Station for the idea of gathering information about how astronauts use the International Space Station. Traditionally, places like the International Space Station are designed with, you know, what can fit where and, and giving, engineering, 100% yes, engineering. Yeah, exactly. And giving the, the best amount or largest amount of usable space to each astronaut you know, each astronaut needs X amount of cubic feet, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. Um, what they're trying to do is actually put things into, a, move things into a way that make more sense. Just like uh, any kitchen designer has this sort of like triangle of your kitchen of anything should be like no more than two or three feet away from each other thing. So when you need ingredients, the refrigerator is not all that far from the oven, not all that far from the sink, et cetera, et cetera. They want to redesign uh, future space stations or possibly even the current space station uh, for better usage. So. Uh, 
uh, what's going to happen is the astronauts are going to be wearing these motion tracking devices that are similar to what you would uh, think of for movies for, you know, blue screens, sure. green screens, cool. that sort of idea, and uh, have the International Space Station sort of mapped out so they can see where they are doing certain tasks when, how much they actually use this area versus that area, and then redesign it so the areas that they get used the most are in a much accessible, much more accessible area, and the areas that don't get used as much can be put away, uh, you know, kind of kept in a corner um principal uh the project principal investigator named kevin dutta i'm just gonna say it like that because it's d-u-d-a and i think it's hilarious from japer said that in the past (laughs) spacecraft design studies focus on these square footage needed per person but we want to understand how astronauts are actually using the volume of the spacecraft in their tasks and this can help inform decisions about how much volume will be needed for a particular task whether it's a research task or even exercise equipment which I think is is brilliant, really, all the way around, and I can't believe we've even waited this long to do such a thing. Uh, and then eventually, hopefully, this could help shape our planning for Mars missions and Mars habitats, <laughs> right? So just making things a little bit better uh, and not putting, like, the bathroom right next to the kitchen. And uh, so Draper's hoping <laughs> to have these devices up to the astronauts in the next three to five years. Cool. Nice. You know, Draper, there is one thing you can work on in the International Space Station that will make everyone happy, and that is the bathroom. If you could fix the bathroom on the International Space Station, I think current and future astronauts mm, yes. would thank you for eternity. Just something to point out. It's not a volume issue per se, although it's with the bathroom. In a way, it is kind of also a volume, volume issue. issue. Yeah, <laughs> and a vol- another volume issue potentially as well. There you are. All right, so, that's uh, that's yeah. space news. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to be talking about the perceived sudden influx of space interest and where that's coming from. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Also launches. Trying to lean in such a way that you can see the rocket. Oh, there we go. Oh, and okay. Right, right, where is it, right? It's actually, a, it's a bobble Ow. rocket. It's a bobble rocket. Hit the top. Hit the top. Bing. No, really, it is. See? It is. If you, oh, it is? Oh, so I can't lean back. that far back. <laughs> <laughs> Not structurally sound for flight, just so you know. Not structurally sound for that's, flight. That's going to lead to Isn't some weird. Isn't that rapid plant disassembly guaranteed? How am I supposed to work with these arrows? This aerod- is awesome. This thing is awesome. <laughs> How am I supposed to work with these aerodynamics? <laughs> All right. Before we get into our main topic this week, I derailed the show. I'm sorry. <laughs> I want to give a huge shout out to all the patrons of tomorrow. These are people who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. If you'd like to figure out, find out how you can contribute to the shows of tomorrow, not that you'd want to anymore, head on over to patreon.com. <laughs> Stop playing with my rocket. Sorry. T-M-R-O. <laughs> Putting your rocket down. Children. Children. All right. Actually, this was your your idea. It was a pretty pretty good one for the main topic, which was uh, there seems to be a... Su- it's tight. Yeah, I mean, it'll do. It's cool. Uh, it seems like there's a sudden influx in space interest, right? Yes. We've got, uh, you know, major, well, at least... I was going to say... Use major, your words. All of, I'm going to use them all at the same time. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> there are news outlets like Engadget, Gizmodo, The Verge, uh, which are pretty large media entities. They're not traditional media entities, but pretty large entities that are covering major space news things regularly, mm-hmm. uh, which I don't think we really saw for the last decade. No. Okay, that's a chicken egg syndrome, though. How so? In the last decade or so. Or there, two. Sure. There, I feel as though there have been more space industry things to cover well that's the second part of this is Mm -hmm. now there's a ton of more space industry stuff happening you've got virgin galactic launching stuff you've got x-core doing things sort of you've got uh, (laughs) really x-core that's the one you chose sure no that's fine well it's it's one of them sure keep going (laughs) blue origin (laughs) blue Blue origin (laughs) what uh mast and space (laughs) systems uh we've got um Oh, oh, Copenhagen. SpaceX, 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 Copenhagen, Copenhagen, Rocket Labs. uh, Oh, Planet Labs. Yes. Right, you got that. You got Planetary Resources. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to hit 10. Worldview. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there, boom, 10, right there. You're the cast. 
That's very hard, 10. Earthcast. Earthcast. There's 11. So forth and so on. There you go. Yeah, uh, a lot. So we've got all of these things happening. So what has changed over the last decade or two? Why, why are these? Is it technology that's changed? And because we're more technologic, technologically capable, now we can just start to do space things? Don't we normally think of space as bringing us the technology? I would say that it's communication. The ability to, to communicate out to the public in general has opened up over the last decade, especially with social media and everything, like with Twitter and Facebook and your ability to actually connect. And YouTube, like you can go watch a video about how they assembled the rocket and then launched it, or you can see things that you usually wouldn't get to see. It's Using communication as a tool to open up access has allowed people to look at space flight from sort of an in-flight, an in-flight, an inside uh, perspective that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Because, you know, back in, say, the 90s, if you wanted an inside perspective on space flight, you would have had to have been an engineer or somebody working for that major company at that time. But now you don't. Now you, I could literally go onto YouTube and I can see videos from Virgin Galactic about what the, what the astronauts who are going to fly on them or the participants who fly on them will do for their training. And I can see what that is actually like as opposed to having to be an engineer working on a system or working with, uh, with a group of people in order to figure that out. Uh, along those same lines, Lur or L R R R in the chat room said SpaceX is doing things in a very public way. It attracts mm -hmm. attention. Absolutely. So did this start with was SpaceX the first one to do something in a public way, or was this done before them? No, I would say it was done before them. Um, X Prize because X Prize yeah, was some, brought up quite a, lot, a bit. A lot of people in the chat room are saying that X Prize was what got them really excited. And I know for me personally, X Prize happened when I was going into uh, 11th grade in high school, and that got me super interested. The Ansari X Prize. Which what? expert? Which expert? And sorry, yeah, yeah. with uh, with uh, spaceship one, yeah, that. Flight, which is like what? That was 06? Uh, 2004. Four, yeah, sorry. 2004. So yeah, that got me really excited about it, and that's when I got hooked again on did, space. Flight, did you say so. that's when you were going into high school? Yeah, no, he's 11th in 11th grade. grade. I was in high school, so. Yeah, oh. we're old. It's cool. Okay, it's cool. Um, it's cool. Uh, Warp 11 said uh, Kerbal Space Program got him hooked. Nice. Is that is that so? Our game, and actually, that's another thing. Lacuna Passage. Kerbal Space Program. There's another one that's out there as well. Space Engineers. Uh, that's not the one I was thinking of, but what's that one? I don't even uh, know That's that one, one where Fun. you are an asteroid miner, and you get to like build parts and uh, build your own custom spaceships, and you go and you mine asteroids for their resources, and you use those resources to build more stuff, and you're a space engineer. I want to be a space really janitor. Cool. Is that, is that a thing? It's kind of like the same thing. Really. Watch, uh, um, uh, Scott Manley does a bunch of space engineer videos. So if you want to see what that game is all about, watch uh, some of his videos about that. And uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. But a lot of those games, if you want to be good at those games, you kind of do have to go and just be like, okay, how do, you, how do they actually do this in real life? And I think that's what's opening the door to a mm -hmm. whole new crowd of people that are gamers that you know, are discovering all this for the first time. So, so does that go back to communication again? Because we're yes, in such a connected world. Yeah, in that, in that, that same vein. Uh, so, all right, but yeah. I also think that the reason why all of this is happening is greed. I think that now there are people that normally wouldn't be interested in the space industry seeing that there is actually potential for a lot of different profit, profit here. For uh, small sat launches, for communication satellites, for asteroid mining, and for all these different things that weren't talked about, in, especially in a public way, 10 years ago. So I think that that is motivated a lot of investors, especially to start showing up at a lot of these different conferences. And they want to know your business plan. They don't care about your engineering. They don't care about your vision. They want to know how much profit you could potentially make from your idea. And if you don't have a business plan, they're not interested. And people that previously were naysayers, like in Google, for example, against these kind of new space companies coming out, are starting to invest now. And they have a deal with Google, they have a deal with OneWeb, they have a deal with Planet Labs, they have a deal with so many different people. And of course, the Google Lunar X Prize. But that in and of itself was kind of a test to see if, I mean, if, let's be honest, it is a small prize for such a hard feat to do to go and land a robot on the moon. And you know, Google hasn't really done a very good job of promoting the, the Google Lunar X Prize. That's just been within the X Prize office, office itself for all of its own marketing. So I think that there is a lot of wasted potential there that uh, Google could be capitalizing on. So uh, I, like I said, it's all these capitalists and investors who are seeing where money could potentially be made that are starting to enter the industry and make things, or at least fund things uh, to be able to happen. So. That's my opinion, anyway. 
Maybe, you know, historically, uh, space flight's been actually a very hard place to make money, and it was kind of brought up, Neuropilot mm -hmm. said, do you know how to make a small fortune in space flight? And actually, I think it's going towards the joke of, uh, the, the proper joke is, uh, do you know how to become a millionaire in space flight? How? Start Spend a billionaire. Billion dollars. Start, as a billionaire. <laughs> start as a billionaire. If you start as a billionaire, you'll, you'll, make, you'll become a millionaire. <clears throat> okay, so, yeah. But piggybacking off of what Mike is saying, um, the launch costs are coming down. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. We were just talking about that yes. last week with Will Pomerantz. Right. right. We're down to about $10 million for a not insubstantial, I mean, not a huge satellite, but still not an insub unsubstantial satellite. So uh, back when Saturn V was Halo. launching, right, mm -hmm. we're talking uh, dollars per kilogram to LEO or low, low Earth, Earth orbit, orbit, right? And we were talking somewhere between twenty and $25,000. Okay. 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 Per kilogram. Per kilogram. <laughs> okay, yep. Per kilogram. Dude. Yeah. Okay, yep. right? So then we go, we fast forward a little bit to the shuttle mm -hmm. era, era, sorry, mm -hmm. and per kilogram, we're talking anywhere between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars, or tw fifteen and twenty, yeah, thousand okay. dollars per kilogram. Actually, I thought it went up, but th that says it went down. It went down a little okay. bit. Yep. Not by a lot, but a little bit. Then mm -hmm. you fast forward all the way to Falcon 9, and you're talking just under five thousand dollars per kilogram. Okay. Okay. Right? Yeah. So we're down quite a bit now. Right, quite a bit. So if you look at that, and so with launch costs coming down, that mm -hmm. gives you opportunity for essentially your dollar being stretched, your dollar going further when you may be investing, right, mm -hmm. into these new opportunities for whatever reason it is, whether it be greed or science or, you know, what have you, uh, that it opens up the doors for more education and more education at different levels. So it's not just higher education or only colleges now. It could be groups that are interested in it. It could be high school groups, and it can also be elementary schools that are interested in doing something uh, in space. It just it opens up those doors quite a bit. I think we're down to the point where launchers can be crowdfunded, whereas they couldn't be before. So right. they're not quite launching yet, but you look at like something like an electron rocket or what's the other one that's not electron? Um, alpha, the alpha rocket from... Uh, Anyhow, there, there are yeah. a couple different rockets that, that are launching for around a million dollars a piece. Yeah. And a million dollars is a crowdfundable number. Yeah. In fact, very much so. I think the luggage is now making like $2 million from crowdfunding. So yeah. if you have a payload you want to send to space and you need to pay for the launcher, you could probably crowdfund the entire launcher cost at this point. $10 million on a Virgin Galactic uh, flight, that's still much, much lower than it was before. So it makes it obtainable now. Mm -hmm. So is is it all of these things together? Is it the, now it's more obtainable, it's not something that, uh, it's something that mere mortals can kind of touch? The thing is, mere mortals can't touch it. A million dollars is still a lot of money, right? I can't afford a rocket launch myself. But also, uh, what would I put up on there? Big... Maybe I'd put my little bobble <laughs> rocket, <laughs> just to be super meta. I think, I think the community of tomorrow now needs to fund launching this into space. I'd, I'd be for it. <laughs> Anyhow, it. Is, is, it a, is it all of these things? Is there... Is there more to it than just this? <sighs> Everyone's like, I don't know. <laughs> I know. Okay. Well, uh, on that <laughs> note. <laughs> that was a rhetorical question, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. On that note, I'll leave it to the community. What do you guys think? Are, a, are you even seeing an influx in space interest, right? Is this something that you're perceiving, or is it just because... There's more talk of it right now that we feel like there's more, but it's actually about the same as before. I feel like entertainment, too, is kind of looking at, at, at uh, space flight as something that's an interesting thing. Because now that, now that the idea of, of accessible space flight is becoming not necessarily a reality yet, but, but a, a very short-term thing that people are going to be doing. I feel like inter, inter, the entertainment industry is taking a look But Star at Trek, that. Star Wars, that goes back decades and decades. decades. Yeah, but, but that's... 2001, a space odyssey. That's sort of like an old... That's like an of. old guard kind of thing. Like, if you, look at, if you look at how many people cared about shuttle before gravity happened, and, and, like, in my circle of friends, nobody really talked about the International Space Station, and then gravity came out, and then all of a sudden my friends were talking about how cool it was that we had an international space station, even though, you know, spoiler alert, it got wrecked in the movie. But what? They were talking about, they were talking about But now do you even just spoiler alert so. that got, it got wrecked in the movie? How about spoiler alert? It's been around for however many years. That too. <laughs> 1998. Right? Yeah. right, thank you. Like, it's been around, it's always, I don't want to say it's always been there, but it's been there for a long enough time 
God, was it really 98 was the first segment? So think about that, mm -hmm. right? So since it's been around since 98, oh. Jared, what year were you born? I was born in 88. So right. I was in fourth grade. When, so the when majority of his life, so. it has already been there. Stop. Yes, you're old. It's fine. It's cool. I'm older than you are, so stop. Um, it's been around for the majority of their lives, yeah. right? And all of a sudden, they started talking about it. Like that, I think that's the significant part there. Yeah. It's not like it just suddenly popped up out of nowhere. Yeah, but it's they, been there. But they knew about it, right? It's not like it's not like your friends didn't know we had Sure, but it's just like, station. okay, sure, but why did didn't... you start this show? You started the show because you heard the space shuttle program was ending. But the space shuttle program, you cared a little bit about the space shuttle program. You knew the space shuttle program was there. It was kind of an okay sort of thing. You may or may not have ever watched any of the shuttle launches since you were a child. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, something clicked, right? Yeah. So for mm -hmm. them... Yeah. Something clicked for them. Yeah, actually, and like to piggyback on that as well, in watching Interstellar, one of my friends literally changed his major from an art, awesome. he was doing art, to theoretical physics because he was so inspired by seeing Interstellar. Awesome. He cool. literally changed it because he wanted to figure out the type of mathematics that it took to do that kind of stuff. That's and cool. That's just like that's awesome. That's mind blowing to me, and that's that's the power of, of especially entertainment media is that it really can do that. It really can set people off on that path to end up doing what they want to do. So if I remember on next week's show, it should we should we should make the topic a continuation of this is okay. So now there's a sudden influx of space. There's an influx of interest. There's an influx of low cost launchers. What does that mean to the future? Right, so people are interested in this stuff now. Yeah. Whereas before they could really care less. Right, they're interested. People are changing majors based mm -hmm. on movies, which a little, you got to admit, a little bit weird. Awesome. That's but not a little the weird. usual, but <laughs> Just, it's so yeah, cool right. that it happened. It's so cool <laughs> it happened, but not the norm. Mm -hmm. Not the yeah. norm. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Right. For sure. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, what does that mean for the future of uh, humans in space? Is this now a people are going to wake up and go, well, why aren't we on Mars? What, what's it going to take to go there? And you're going to get more people working towards that goal? Uh, or does it mean nothing has changed and that this is just a short-term little blip on the radar before people stop caring again and going back down to whatever the number? If we remember, that should be our topic for next week. I do want to know what you think. Um, do you feel there is a sudden influx in space or has it always been there? It's just that now we can see it more because of social media. Um, and if there is a sudden influx in space, where is that coming from? Where do you think it's coming from? Do you agree with this? Is there something else that we didn't talk about on the show? Leave your comments on YouTube, Reddit, uh, Twitter, wherever you like, any one of our social media channels. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, first off, we're going to do another launch calendar because <laughs> we need to do second launch calendar of the show. Uh, so after that launch calendar, comments from our last show. And welcome back to tomorrow. We were just talking in the break. We were looking at the launch calendar, pointing the uh, 16th on that one was, in fact, another Chinese launch. And so that's what's uh, th that w that was the one that brings them up uh, yet another launch for the year 2015. What year is it? 2015. 2015. Yeah. 2015. Uh, and if you'd like more information on uh, what launches are coming up this week, next week, and in the future, head on over to launchlibrary.net. That is an open source. Uh, it's not really an open source. It's an open a uh, API that you can uh, develop against if you want to for free and uh, put upcoming launches into your application. So we use it here on the show for our launch, uh, launch calendars every week. We also use it on our Roku channel. Uh, there are some great Windows Phone apps, Android apps, iPhone apps, all using launch libraries so you can stay up to date with the latest launches. And then even go watch them live if you're interested. And going back towards the uh, community aspect of everything, you can go, oh, hey, look, let's watch this you know, Atlas V launch go live. So. Uh, all right, cool. Uh, before we get started with comments from last week's show, I'd like to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who don't have to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are our Patreon Plus subscribers. They're going to get access to After Dark as soon as it is made available online. And they also get a, their name in the show and access to our Google Hangouts whenever we do those. <laughs> oh, but there's more. We also have our patron subscribers. If you want to get your name in the show, that costs you as little as one penny 
per episode. That's right, as little as one penny. Get your name in the show and rewards. Like I said, we are a crowdfunded show and every single penny does help. So head on over to patreon.com slash tmro and help us do epic awesome things. All right, let's go ahead and get started with some comments from our last episode. This one comes from Ben Hamilton off of YouTube. I thought SpaceX was only testing re reusability on CRS missions. Space Mike? Well, uh, all up in the camera on uh, that one. SpaceX is testing reusability for everything. They don't just want for CRS missions, but every single Falcon 9 mission they want to reuse the first stage, the capsule, and eventually the second stage as well. So they're testing for, for everything. And, you know, they've been, have made a lot of progress on, on being able to reuse or at least land the first stage of the Falcon 9. And something that was really interesting is uh, uh, the, the, the Falcon 9 program had, had the Grasshopper vehicle, which was the test bed for it. And then after Grasshopper, they had the Falcon 9 R Dev 1. And after five flights on the last one, it kind of veered out of control. And uh, the, the, I guess the, the, the launch uh, range manager uh, uh, used the launch abort, or the com computer itself used the launch abort to destroy the vehicle so that it wouldn't veer off course and uh, hit something nearby. Anyway, there was going to be a Dev 2 vehicle, but uh, that was never, it may have possibly built. That's a, that's a subject for another day. But instead of building that, they just went to straight uh, operational tests of Falcon 9 launches trying to land, uh, land on, on the barge, all the soft landings that they did over the ocean before that. So, you know, that was a, a much better test to collect more information that they need to be able to do that. And uh, now they're starting on being able to do testing of the, the reusability of the space capsule itself by using the Super Draco thrusters, if not used for a launch abort purpose, to be able to use those to uh, make a propulsive landing back at a pad like a Cape Canaveral or even uh, Vandenberg if they start launching crewed missions from there in the future. So they're planning on reusing everything. And they already have a long history of reusing hardware for future stuff. For example, the qualification uh, core stage for their Falcon 9 version 1.1, which is now going to be retired, the last one's gonna be for the Jason 3 launch. Uh, excuse me, uh, th that vehicle, that qualification test article was reused to make the Falcon 9 R Dev 1 vehicle that flew five times. So they already, that's just one example. They've done a lot of reusability of a ton of their hardware for other purposes. And the Dragonfly vehicle, that's the test bed for uh, reusing the Dragon capsule, was first used for the pad abort test. So there's another example just off the top of my head right there. So they're reusing everything. Sorry for the long uh, answer to that uh, simple question, but but yeah, they're right. reusing everything. Uh, also, I did catch that. <laughs> that was a <laughs> thanks, Sorry. Dada. That was great. Um, <laughs> back over here. <laughs> there we go. Uh, back <laughs> over here. <laughs> I have that power. Um, I did want to point out that you did combine the word launch and land into lanch uh, at one point. Lanch. lanch. So that is a, a, a new term that we will add into our chat the room. The lanching site? The lanching site. It's a launching landing site. It's lanching. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> comment Lord. This one comes from Joseph Harner, also off of YouTube. The highest terrain feature in Florida is 345 feet, or about 115 meters above sea level. So the vehicle assembly building actually is taller than the entire state of Florida. And then, for some reason, Ben decided to copy and paste this directly into the original message, even though it's something that I wrote and not what Joseph wrote, which was to say that the four high bays internal height are 456 feet and not quite 139 meters, which is a little over 45 stories. Because what you're supposed to do is break it down Yeah, like it doesn't that. matter. So the point is, though, that uh, the highest terrain vehicle, <laughs> Florida, just... is 345 feet or 115 meters, and the vehicle assembly building is 456 feet or not quite 139 meters. So, yes, the vehicle assembly building is actually taller than the entire state of Florida <laughs> in terrain. I just got scolded I'm... on air. The inside of the VAB is the 111 feet higher than the state of Florida. Yeah. The, the inside. Inside, not the exterior. And no, the VAB the is a one story building. Yes. The world's largest one story building. Florida. Our... Florida's flat. <laughs> That's just what happens. Are we scolding Florida That's... for being flat? Yes. That's what happens. Yes, right. we are. Comment, Lord. Hey, even flat girls in love. Uh, Michael Smith. This one comes from Michael Smith off of YouTube. I'm not convinced of Launcher One's future. Pegasus has been around for 25 years now. I love that launch system, but they've only put up two satellites in the past seven years. That's not exactly being flooded with orders. Yeah, and actually, uh, Space Mike, you added some notes as to uh, you think it might be cost-related. 
I think so, because uh, Virgin Galactic is uh, putting out there that the Launcher 1 system would cost about $10 million per launch. If they can stick to that number or even make it even cheaper than that, then compared to the Pegasus rocket, the Pegasus XL right now, as of 2014, is $56.3 million per launch. That's US dollars. So, I mean, 10 million versus uh, 56 million, that's, that's, that's a big difference. So there is a possibility that Launcher 1 could get a lot more orders than Pegasus, but well, who knows? 5X less expensive. Yeah. Uh, and you have, you can... Yeah, I was going to say, and you can launch it from just about anywhere, but, you know, yeah. Pegasus, so. Yeah, well, that market's also opening up, too. Right, it's, because... That market's expanding. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. back in the day, we didn't really have nanosats, microsats, no. picosats, all these really small things where it actually made a ton of sense. And so, yeah. you know, both sides of the market are starting to turn, create something that might be usable yeah. for these new markets. It's, it's all about timing, right? Mm -hmm. So... Um, actually, someone in the chat room even mentioned uh, uh, Beale Aerospace, where Beale Aerospace came around before SpaceX, doing basically what SpaceX is doing, but they didn't get the timing right. They were they were off just they were just a little too early to the yeah. market, and because of that, they couldn't sustain the business. And same thing could be uh, between say um, um, Pegasus and yes. Launcher All right, launch on that note. On that note, she's writing notes in the show notes just to mess with me. <laughs> On that note, we're gonna uh, we're gonna go into after dark. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. Uh, well, <laughs> you 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 you. All right, you know you closed the show because you derailed me. <laughs> <laughs> on next week's show, we will have a very vibrant discussion on all things space. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Those of you watching live, don't forget to stick around for After Dark, because it will prove to be interesting. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.